You're listening to the Radius Church Podcast, recorded live each Sunday in North Hollywood, California. If you joined us a few weeks ago for Mother's Day, you probably got the impression uh, that my wife and I are using quarantine to introduce our girls to Hitchcock movies. And I don't know if that qualifies us as bad parents, but we're doing it nonetheless. And I will also recommend it because there is nothing like watching Psycho again with someone who does not know the twist. It's a a special kind of joy. Uh, They love most of what they've seen so far. Their favorite is Rear Window, which is a great choice. I will tell you that we went a little far with the birds. I had forgotten how graphic that movie is, and it really, really messed with our youngest. And again, like I've said before, we are already putting money away for their future therapy, and that's just another reason that they're going to need it. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to go from Hitchcock to our current climate in this world. And I don't just mean the headlines that are disturbing us and distressing us right now. I mean that we are in another election cycle. And if we could characterize some of the strongest emotions that people feel during every political season, one of the words that we would use would be fear. Fear that we're going to go backwards or fear that we're going to stay the same. You know, fear that taxes are going to go up or fear that employment is going to go down or fear that hatred is going to go up, fear that civility is going to go down, fear that the Democrats will have too much control, fear the Republicans will seize too much control. You'll hear, if he's re-elected, I'm afraid. Or you'll also hear, if he's elected, I'm afraid. And it's not helping that right now in 2020, our world is afraid of infection and restrictions and hunger and joblessness. We humans are sitting ducks for fear and fear and more fear. We're peddlers of fear. Uh, I'll give you an example from my personal life. We're parents, my wife and I, and I remember when we got pregnant with our first, I'm not supposed to say we got pregnant, when my wife was pregnant with our first child, you know, every once in a while we'd come across a parent that would just tell us, well, listen, just you wait, and that baby comes out, enjoy it now because it's gonna be sleepless nights and poop everywhere and yeah, we know. Uh, And then when we found out or when we told people that we had two daughters, you know, when we had our two kids, you know, (laughs) inevitably you're going to hear people say like, oh man, just wait until they're teenagers. It's going to get crazy. What is that? I mean, it's the same thing that you hear people say when they're talking about a candidate that they oppose and they'll say if he or she is elected or reelected, then this country is doomed. Why do we do that? I think we're tempted to do that because we feel this need to plant fear into each other's lives because if I, can, if I can give you my level of fear, then I don't have to have a greater level of courage. And I wish I could tell you that faith conversations and churches are places where, where you don't come across the same kind of panic. I, I've seen some of the most courageous lives in my life within faith communities, but I've also seen the same kind of panic that you see in every other aspect of life. You know, when the last election uh, came around, there were plenty of people who did not see it going the way that it went, did not want this candidate elected, and they were panicking, and they were stunned, and they were shocked, and they sounded just like everybody else, faith or not, Jesus or not. In recent months, when we've had to shelter in place, I've heard plenty of people within churches say, this is a persecution of the church because we have to stay at home. Panic and fear. When the series started, I said, what would it mean if you could put your faith before your politics? And as we close the series today, I want to ask, what would it mean for you to put your faith before your fear? And it's not just a way to distract your mind, to ignore some of how you feel. I don't mean that. It's not just some superstitious mind trick at all. This is actually an essential element to every kind of progress we have ever seen in the history of the world. Faith. Faith, in many ways, is what has gotten us here in the ways that we are most proud of, in the ways that we are most content. It is faith that has produced the best results in the history of the world. There's this letter that circulated 2,000 years ago, and we actually still get to read it today. And it was a letter written from a Jesus follower to a bunch of other Jesus followers who were ethnically Hebrew, and it was just exploring what impact their faith has in the world and in the climate that they were living in. Their faith was not popular. Their faith was not easy for other people to understand. And so it was important for them to understand how are they supposed to live? How are they supposed to act? What are they supposed to do with their concerns and their nerves and their fears? And one of the sections of this letter is so helpful for us even today. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says this. Now, faith is confidence. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. 
And then the writer of this letter goes on to name all kinds of names that maybe you've heard of, even if you've never cracked open a Bible. He names Abraham, and, and Isaac is in here, and Moses, and, and King David, the most famous Jewish king ever. And then he names some people that are, are lesser-known characters. Maybe you've never heard of Moses' mom or of Rahab, but these were all people that showed incredible examples of faith in the midst of otherwise terrifying circumstances. In fact, the only reason you have ever heard of anybody, probably, in the history of the world doing anything good or anything notable is because of some kind of faith. That's why he says in the next sentence, this faith is what the ancients were commended for. This is what they were known for. So what is this? What is is faith? We, We try to explain from time to time that faith, even though often confused with belief, is something different. Faith is, isn't just a belief. We all have beliefs, and it really doesn't matter much in our day-to-day. Like, for example, our youngest daughter believed that the Birds movie was not real, but it still, she still had nightmares that night. The belief did not overcome what made her scared. Uh, you know, maybe some of you have you know, seen roller coasters, and you know for a fact they're engineered very well, and they've got a great track record, but you ain't getting on that roller coaster no matter what. Fear outguns belief all the time. But faith, faith is something stronger. Faith is a lifestyle. Uh, The simplest way I can think to describe it is faith simply is acting, not necessarily feeling, but acting as though it's entirely true. And this faith, this action, this lifestyle historically has walked right into messes, has walked right into fear, has walked right into danger. You forget birds in the Bates Motel. Listen to some of the circumstances that faith has pushed people to endure through. Jumping down to verse 36, some, some of these people of faith, they faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, and that wasn't some sort of like a fashion choice. They were destitute, persecuted, mistreated. And after that list of terrible circumstances, the writer of this letter just stops dead in his or her tracks, and marvels. Marvels. Listen to, listen to this in the next sentence. The world was not worthy of them. Legendary lives have come before us who faced impossible odds and impossible pain and impossible circumstances, and they did not back down. They did not change their tune. They did not change with the seasons. And these are lives so solid and so daring that the world around would look at them hear their stories, and wonder, who are these people? And the writer of this letter, knowing these stories, said the world wasn't good enough for them. And that made sense because they didn't live like they needed the world to be good enough for them. They had something else that they were living for. You know, at the moment that people reported seeing Jesus ascend into heaven, which I know sounds absolutely fanciful for a lot of us on the other side of the screen right now, but just go with me for a second. At the moment that the scriptures report that people saw Jesus ascending into heaven, it said it was about 120 people, a little over 100 people. And that's a lot of people, but it's nowhere near like critical mass or a good sample size, right? And I know that you might not trust, uh, you might not trust the Bible, and that's perfectly fine, but I just want you to keep in mind what it is that we're dealing with here. If the scriptures that I am quoting from here are a propaganda piece, they certainly could have spun the story differently. Because the way the story of Jesus is told in the scriptures is a man who at his zenith was impacting thousands of people. He had, so, he had huge crowds that were hanging on every word that he said. And then he endures a shameful execution and there is nobody, nobody at all. Even the authors of these biographies, probably at great pain, had to admit, even we gave up believing what Jesus said after we saw the crucifixion. So if this is an account of someone trying to sell you success, they're failing. Now, outside of Scripture, outside of the Bible, just look at history. And history tells us that Jesus was a man from Nazareth. And before he amassed any wealth, before he commanded any armies, before he conquered any nations, he was crucified before anybody outside of his zip code had even heard of him before. And this was also at a time when Caesar was worshipped. So another way for us to understand that is people had more reliance on the government to change history than they did on any god. It was also a time of incredible pluralism. And to understand that, that just is the assumption that whatever you believe is probably equally valid as long as it doesn't hurt people. 
Now, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you or not, but I feel like we're living through some of the same circumstances right now. And it was right in the middle of that, that a handful of women and men did not just change their families, didn't just change their neighborhoods or their societies, but they reached every nation in the developed world in a matter of months. How does that happen? How is it that today, more people have heard of the name of Jesus, more people worship the name of Jesus than any other name in the history of the world, and Caesar makes pizzas. I have one quality that I think has moved the name of Jesus, the ideas of Jesus forward. These people had faith. They had faith based on a conviction. Not, not, a, not a preference, uh, you know, not, not just an opinion, a conviction. And do you know the difference between an opinion and a conviction? An opinion is something that you hold because you like it, right? You have an opinion about your favorite color or about where to find the best street tacos uh, or what you're going to binge on Netflix after you watch this. After you watch this, by the way. But a conviction, a conviction is different. A conviction is rooted in your conscience. I've just seen too much to do anything else. I, I know too much to do anything else. So while you may hold an opinion... A conviction, in some ways, holds you. It carries you. It's the kind of thing that news gives you, right? Not just ideas, right? Not just good moral teaching, news. Like, coronavirus is news. Like, the results of the next election is going to be news. And it does not matter how you feel. It is what is. And if you're going to be honest, you have to live in light of facts. That's conviction. And what we've seen throughout history is when the world seemed darker and darker and darker, there were people who had such conviction that they put that into action. They exercised faith. They had every reason in the world to carry hope into the darkest regions and into the darkest stories because they believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was ultimately writing history and the central figure The centerpiece of all of history was Jesus. And that central figure could not be conquered by anything, even death. One of my favorite stories is actually not in Scripture. It's a story of a man named William Tyndale. I don't know if you've ever heard of William Tyndale, but this was a man who was arrested, he was strangled, and he was burned to death because he wanted to do a crazy thing. He wanted to translate the Hebrew and Greek Scriptures into English, so that English-speaking people could read it for themselves and make up their own minds. It seems like a great idea. But at the time, that was punishable by death. But William Tyndale thought it was worth it. The reason that you and I, I think, have countless English translations available to us in an app is largely because of the courage and the faith, the conviction of William Tyndale. And while he was burning on that stake... His final prayer was for the king to change his mind. Not not about William's execution, but actually about the Bible for everyone. Two years after William's death, the king published Tyndale's Bible for the Church of England. And today, the BBC, not the Church of England, the BBC ranks William Tyndale as 26th of the 100 greatest Brits of all time. Because this man lived a legendary life of faith. This is the way it is in every generation, from Egypt to Babylon to Assyria to Persia to Rome to Enlightenment France to Nazi Germany to Maoist China to Marxist Russia to (laughs) me first, happiness above all else, America. Faith is what has propelled people forward through impossible odds. In fact, it has grown fastest when the odds were most stacked against it. But enough history. Now let's talk about the present. Uh, The writer of the letter pivots and stops talking about the lives that have come before and is now talking about you and me. Even though this letter is 2,000 years old, I believe this is talking about something we need to hear right now, today. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since we have so many examples of what a legendary life looks like, let's keep this faith to ourselves and blend in and complain about traffic and live for likes and blame our parents and blame rich people and blame the church and pray that Jesus doesn't make our lives too uncomfortable before the day we die. No. 
let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, destructive choices, inadequate choices that hold us back and hold us down, and let us run with perseverance, unstoppable momentum, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes not on what scares us, but on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Here's how he did it. For the joy set before him, for the bigger goal set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, before he could prove that death did not have to tell us how to live, he had to endure a death. To really walk in faith, to follow him in faith, to show us that we have nothing left to fear, this is where we can go to. It says, consider him. Consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinners. Plenty of people who are trying to hold him back and hold him down. So that you also, you will not grow weary and lose heart. In other words, no matter what's happening in the world around you, no matter what's happening in your relationships, no matter what's happening in politics, you do not have to stop. You know, early on in this pandemic, I was being asked by a lot of people, how are we supposed to get through this? And is this like the worst circumstance the world has ever seen? And I don't know what the world's going to look like on the other side of, of this season. A friend of mine shared with me something that I'd actually read before, but I'd forgotten about, written by a brilliant man who was living through another difficult time in the history of the world, a man living during World War II, and listen to what this brilliant man wrote. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I'm tempted to reply, why? As you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, You and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made. And the first, I love this, action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, and listen, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. I'm going to level with you. The world's going to be full of trouble and pain, and then you will die. Listen, we don't have to panic about who's going to be elected. We should care, but we don't have to be panicked. We don't have to be panicked about what's going to happen this November because it's not going to change ultimately what we're in for. We do not have to grow weary. We don't have to lose heart. So not just to Jesus followers out there, but every single person listening to me right now on the other side of the screen, I want you to stop asking if the next president is going to improve your quality of life. I certainly hope that the next president does. But instead, a more powerful question that you must ask yourself today is, what's going to stop me? You know, you can tell where you have ultimately placed your faith by what stops you. You can tell where you've ultimately placed your faith by what devastates you. A lot of us, and I've certainly done this, you've placed your faith in your health or in a dollar or in a boyfriend or a job or a preacher or a president. And when those things inevitably fail you, will it devastate you? Will it stop you? Because... If you resolve now to live the kind of faith the world isn't worthy of, it is going to change how you face the next four years, whatever they contain. Come on, if you believe 
that God has eternity in store for every life that trusts in Jesus, then you can be among the most confident people in the world because you know the future. You know how the story is going to be told in the end. If you believe that, you can be among the most curious people in the world because whatever we discover about how the world works and how we got here scientifically is just another example of how creative our God is and how powerful our God is. If we really believe this, then we can be among the most compassionate people in the world because we have it on good authority, not just our preferences that every single person is worth loving to death. And nothing has to stop us from living in light of the facts. We will live by faith. The world needs to see it. My daughters need to see it. The next generation certainly needs to see it. Our nation needs to see this. We need to surround people with legendary lives of unflinching faith because there's plenty of fear all around us and there's plenty of people trying to sell us fear so that we can reduce ourselves to the level of their panic rather than call each other to the level of nobility. That fear, that fear is always going to outgun our preferences. That fear is always going to outgun our politics. That fear is always going to outgun even our beliefs. But fear is no match for faith. Listen, my friend, it does not matter what happens this November. Put your faith before your fear because God wants to change the world again. You know how I know it? Because you're here, and I'm here. And it wasn't too long ago when a generation just like this, with nothing but faith, changed the world. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so many examples of what faith can do in the midst of fear, let's throw off everything that holds us back and hold us down because it's our time. It's our move. It's our turn. Now I want to close in a way that we often do. I want to talk to someone right now who absolutely needs to hear what I'm about to say. Please, please, please give me your undivided attention. Don't click off of this, even though you're going to be tempted to do so. I don't think you have a problem with faith. I think you have a very, very strong faith in all kinds of things. But you may not have faith in a strong enough thing. If you want more than ordinary, if you want more than just ordinary courage and certainly more than ordinary fear, I don't want you right now today to concentrate on placing an extraordinary amount of faith in typical ideas or just in yourself. Instead, I want you to reallocate any amount of faith you have in an extraordinary savior. That's how you're going to overcome the fear that you have of the future. That's how you're going to live truly in what is reality. It has the power to change your life forever, but you have to make the choice. So I want to ask you a question. You have all the power. I'm not there to you know, do the hard sell in the room with you. You have no pressure at all. Here's the question. Have you started a life with Jesus? Be honest. Have you started a life with Jesus? I know you've heard about him. You might even admire him, but have you chosen to say, yes, Jesus, I need you to lead my life. I give up trying to do this on my own. I know from my own story and from my experience, the reason people avoid deciding ultimately to follow Jesus is because we all know intuitively that deciding has a lot at stake. Something old has to end in order for us to decide on something. In fact, the word decide, side, is the root of it. And side means kill as in homicide or genocide. So when we decide on something, something old, something normal, something routine, something has to die. And in my experience, the bigger the breakthrough, the more significant the break. So it's intuitive that choices this significant scare us because we know something's got to die. So... Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, who for what was possible, for the joy set before him, he faced a death. He faced a death to prove that death does not have to define life anymore for us. So are you ready for that realization? Are you ready to live not just with your preferences? Are you ready to live a life that cannot be devastated, but a life of faith? Are you ready to act as though it's true? 
If so, then I simply want you to talk to God the way that millions of people have before us, the way that I have. This conversation that has truly changed everything for so many. And in whatever posture you want to take and whatever words you want to use, here's what I want you to express to God if you're ready to start this new life. God, I know my choices matter and I know they haven't all been perfect. So obviously I need to be forgiven. And I would want to pay you back because you're perfect. But I realize that Jesus' death covered the gap. I couldn't pay you back if I wanted to and you don't expect me to. You loved me so much that you, you spanned the distance. I believe that Jesus' death was enough for me to be forgiven. But today, I also believe, I believe that Jesus is alive again, which means I have nothing left to fear. Death does not have to define life anymore. So Jesus, today, save me from a life without you and lead me to a life I can't have without you. You know, God's promised us that if we are willing to have that conversation with him, to not just believe it or prefer it, but to truly take that step of faith, make a choice to trust him with everything, that he is going to be faithful to call us a son or a daughter of him, of the king. If you've made that decision today, or maybe you're close to that decision, but you just need a little more information, I want you to go right now to a place on our website that we have created just for you radius.la forward slash decide. And you can hear everything about what this decision entails and why it matters so much for your life. I love you. We love you. No matter what happens this year, we have plenty of reasons to fear, but we have even more reasons to hope. Be people of faith. Thank you for listening. For more information, follow us on social media at Radius Church LA and visit us on the web at radius.la.